This is a detail of a tapestry woven from that design now in the Spanish Royal Collection that, that we have here in the exhibition. <clears throat> it's a tribute to the, the recovery of the Flemish workshops that they were so successful in reproducing these designs, but they were extremely challenging because they were so volumetric. And it's perhaps no coincidence that Rubens receives no more commissions for, for commercial tapestry production until the 1630s. In France at this time, in Paris, there's also a resurgence of weaving. The French king, Henry IV, had persuaded large numbers of Flemish weavers to relocate to Paris in the early years of the century as part of efforts he was making to um, invigorate the French economy. And he, you know, he banned the importation of Flemish tapestries, for example. In the search for new designs, the Paris workshops too turn to Rubens. And we have exam various examples of various Paris tapestries from the early years of the century, including this scene from a set designed by Rubens in 1622 of the story of Constantine. Uh, this is the, the moment when Constantine defeats the army of his rival, Maxentius, who falls to his death along with his, those of his troops. As the, bat, as the Milvian Bridge collapses beneath him. There's a wonderful account of this design arriving in Paris with the French courtiers standing around and critiquing it. They loved the, the historical accuracy of the costumes and these figures clinging on for grim life from the edge of the bridge. But, they said, they're not, we're not quite sure you got the proportions of the legs right. And you know, it, it reflects the problems that the Rubens designs presented to the weavers, because in concentrating so exclusively on large figures in sparse settings, you know, he was really, uh, the, the, the weavers had to be absolutely uh, working to a, a very high standard. There was no decorative patterning to disguise imperfections of proportion. And it, perhaps that may explain why, in the, again, in the search for new designs, the French king, Louis XIII, turns to an artist, Simon Vouet, a brilliant artist who was living in Rome, and he's brought back to Paris in 1627, specifically to produce decorative schemes and tapestry designs. And, and Vouet, who has absorbed uh, the, the lessons of contemporary Italian painters, introduces a highly classicist style to Paris tapestry design. This scene is from an, an Old Testament set. Of the, uh, and this scene is the finding of the infant Moses, uh, made in about 1640 for the Palais du Louvre, and it epitomizes his, his approach with these graceful figures dressed in rich robes, set in a deep landscape with ancient ruins around, lit by a low-angled, delicate evening uh, light, and all within wide, detailed architectural borders. And this is the style that has come to dominate um, French tapestry production in the 1630s and the 1640s. It's very thoughtful, with a very fine attention to line and to detail. The French example also stimulates the English monarch, James I, to set up his own workshop in London in 1619. About 50 Flemish weavers were brought over in great secrecy, along with all of their families, because by now there are strict uh, punishments in the Low Countries to try and deter any further migration. And primarily with funding from the Crown and the Duke of Buckingham, Exquisite tapestries are made at Mortlake, this is a village on the outskirts of London, in the 1620s and the 1630s, from designs by an artist called Franz Klein, or Francis Klein, who was, um, at his best, was, a, was a, a great tapestry designer. But his work is almost unknown today um, because all the great Mortlake tapestries were sold from the English royal collection 
after the execution of Charles I. And many ended up in the French royal collection and are now belong to the French state. Where, and they're just kept in storage. There's no, um, they have so many of their own French tapestries <clears throat> that there's no call for the display of these pieces, regrettably. This piece comes from the Swedish royal collection. <clears throat> in the fifth gallery of the exhibition, we go back to Brussels and a single set commissioned from Rubens by the Archduchess Isabella in the mid-1620s. Isabella had wanted to retire to a convent in Madrid after her husband's death, but affairs of state kept her in Brussels. So instead, she commissioned a wonderful present for the convent. Um, it was to be a a celebration of the triumph of the Catholic Church to be hung on feast days. And instead of thinking of a traditional set of tapestries, you know, hung in a single tier with decorative borders, Rubens conceived of an all-surrounding trompe l'oeil illusion, which involved two tiers of tapestries hung one above the other. And instead of traditional borders, he, he, he conceived faux architectural elements, pillars supporting an architrave from which putti appear to be hanging up a tapestry. So the images within the tapestries are tapestries within tapestries. You know, his, you know, this is Rubens introducing essentially Roman high Baroque illusionism to tapestry design. <clears throat> and we have two splendid pieces from this set in the exhibition along with various oil sketches and modelli, such as the, the Prado modello that I just showed. In the following galleries, we have tapestries designed by Rubens's contemporaries and followers, figures like Jacob Jordans, who pick up on his innovative ideas, but translate them into a form that can be uh, reproduced commercially. The Brussels workshops have relatively little, you know, they have no constant stream of royal funding. So they're, they're dependent on a, a large commercial market and tapestries therefore have to be, you know, not too overly expensive. And Jordan's is a, was a very prolific designer. Uh, this is a panel from so a set of scenes of country life in which we, we see figures caught it, almost as if by accident going about their daily activities set in the, these shallow architectural niches. Um, there's a wonderful feeling of spontaneity about the designs, which are very artful, and have all sorts of underlying symbolism within them. But the attraction of these architectural settings was that they are relatively easy to weave, guaranteeing the kind of the, the viability of, of the designs for sale. In the following gallery, we have tapestries made in Italy, in Florence and in Rome, a reminder of the fact that the, uh, the Italian uh, patrons are just as, a they are also avid collectors and users of tapestry. It's not just a northern art form. The Cosimo de' Medici had set up a workshop in Florence in the 1540s, and his successors keep this going right the way through the 17th century. And in 1627, Francesco Barberini, nephew of Pope Urban VIII, also sets up a workshop in Rome, which produces designs by Pietro da Cortona and Romanelli, of which we have examples. And it's very much, you know, tapestry is a, a manifestation of princely magnificence. And these workshops are a reflection of the aspirations of the, the Medici and the, and the Barberini 